shall we begin? Let the games begin. All right, all right, all right. A new age has begun. An age of freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? This is the chopper! This is going to be quite a ride. <laughs> And welcome to the Movie Fit Podcast. I am your host, Christian. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast this week. We have quite a lot to get to, so let's not waste any time. But before I get to all that, I do need to do my usual spiel, which is this is the Movie Fit Podcast, where we talk about all of the big breaking movie news items of the week. We also talk about all the trailers that came out this week, and we have quite a few of those, so we're going to get to that. But before we get to all that, we're going to talk about two movie news items that came out after the podcast went up last week very quickly because they're very quick news but i do want to mention them because um one of them is uh involves someone that i'm uh, a huge fan of john logan the writer behind movies like the aviator and hugo and gladiator and skyfall inspector and, and the last samurai uh rango the showtime series penny dreadful he is set to make his dictator debut uh for a blumhouse movie called the whistler camp which is a movie described as a, quote, queer empowerment story set at a gay conversion camp. Uh, but that is all that they know about the movie. Uh, casting is currently underway for the film, but I'm a huge fan of John Logan and never think that he's done. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out there because uh, that's pretty cool. The next movie news item that came out after the podcast went up last week was an adaptation of the novel My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix has found its cast and director. The movie will be directed by Damon Thompson, who directed the TV series Killing Eve at Penny Dreadful, speaking of Penny Dreadful. And it started production last week, actually, with the exception, or with the expectation, I should say, uh, that it will land over on Amazon Studios. The cast includes young stars Elsa Fisher from 8th Grade, Amaya Miller, she was in uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, or not Rise, uh, War for the Planet of the Apes. Uh, Kathy Ang and Rachel, I'm going to mispronounce her last names, uh, Olchi Kanyu. Something along those lines. Um, I am very sorry <laughs> to, to you. The novel, set in 1988, centered on the relationship between Abby and Gretchen, two best friends and sophomores in high school. Their friendship is tested when an evening of skinny dipping goes wrong and Gretchen begins to act differently, followed by bizarre occurrences. After some investigating, Abby begins to hor- Abby begins to horrifyingly suspect that her friend may be possessed by a demon force. Fisher will play Abby, while Miller will play Gretchen, and the other two, because I'm going to mispronounce the last names, the other two uh, will play friends in the group. The book is supposed to be very good, at least from what I was able to gather online, so we could end up uh, looking at a pretty decent adaptation if, of course, they, you know, follow the spirit of the book. So let's move on from that to our uh, trailer talk. We're going to talk about trailers this week. Like I mentioned, we have quite a few to get to. Just some quick trailer thoughts on other, uh, the smaller trailers that came out this week. Uh, The first one was Seance. That is directed by Simon Barrett. He was the writer on films like You're Next and The Guest. He is making his directorial debut with this, which follows Camila, uh, played by Suki Waterhouse from Assassination Nation, and The Bad Batch, uh, those are probably the two big movies that you will probably recognize her from. A new student at a, pre- at a prestigious school academy for girls who doesn't quite fit in. That is until she and a few girls attempt a seance after she finds out her dorm room is haunted. And of course, things don't go as planned. Uh, so, a seance opens in theaters, digital, and on, on demand on May 21st. It looks okay. From what I, from what I can gather, um, I don't know. I just it, it looks. Uh, if anything, I think the writing will probably be perfect. Will be will be. I won't say perfect. That's that's a big word, uh, especially on a movie. But um, <laughs> but I think the the writing at least will be will at least drive the story a little bit, especially if Barrett's behind it, because obviously like your next and the guests are very very well written. Um, so I trust him on that. But uh, the movie wise, trailer wise, just. Didn't really sell too much. Just it's just I don't know. I think it's just the way that it was edited together. I just didn't, I wasn't a fan of it. Uh, moving on, the next trailer, flashback that stars Dylan O'Brien as Frederick, who's living his best life until he starts having horrifying visions of Sydney, played by Mankum and Monroe from It Follows and the god awful Independence Day sequel. 
She was in other stuff too, but those are the two that pop in my head for some reason. Uh, a girl who vanished in high school after reaching out to her old friends with whom he used to take mystery, uh, the mystery drug called the Mercury. Frederick realizes the only way to stop the visions lies deep within his own memory, so he embarks on a terrifying mental odyssey to learn the truth. Flashback will open in select theaters and VOD platforms on June 4th, or if you're of the Blu-ray and other digital platforms, um crowd you can just wait four days because it will come out on june 8th very weird this trailer was interesting it started it, it kind of like just descends into straight madness as the trailer goes on uh i, I don't know i i it, it looks like at one point um he's having problems you know figuring out what's real and what isn't it looks like he's flashing forward and then flashing back to his life it's 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 a it's a pretty interesting concept uh trailer wise i just i i, I don't i just i don't know how i feel about the movie uh it's kind of hard to like gauge trailers nowadays when you're in you know you're stuck at home because it's like it used to i used to be like if this if i saw this trailer like in the movie theater i'd be like oh yeah i'm gonna probably go watch that but now i'm watching it here at home i'm sitting here at home like i don't know <laughs> that's just I don't, I don't know that's just the way i guess it is maybe it's just me anyway moving on uh the other quick trailer uh that we have to talk about is the water man that is directed by david oluello from like selma and the first rise of the planet of the apes movie uh that follows the adventures of a young boy named gunner uh who f- moves to a small town a uh, small rural town with his mother played by rosario dawson and his father played by david oluello uh when his mother's illness worsens gunner attempts to seek out the local legend known as the water man who is said to be able who was set to able who is said to be able to cheat death apparently i can't say that sentence uh the movie co-stars amaya miller which we just mentioned which we just talked about uh alfred molina and maria bello the movie premiered at the toronto international film festival last year with the movie finally coming out uh, on may 7th here in the states unless you live internationally where you can just watch it on netflix uh, i'm assuming probably on may 7th as well i don't know this trailer was it wasn't that bad i think the only thing that i really have a gripe with the trailer is that i think it gives a, i think gives just a little bit too much away because it kind of plays off of the you know it's a small town urban legend kind of thing and i think it just gives away just a little bit too much kind of like the mystery aspect of it all i think it kind of gives away a little bit of that um but that could just be me i don't know so there that there is that but uh it looks it it, it, look, it looks it doesn't look too bad to be honest on the last trailer we're going to talk about, or at least the last trailer we're going to talk about very quickly, is uh, Riders of Justice. This is a trailer that I just saw, that I literally just saw before I started recording. Mads Mikkelsen, which we will talk about later on the podcast, uh, stars as a, sol- as a soldier whose wife gets killed in a train accident. I say that with quotation marks. And comes back home to look after his teenage daughter. But one of the people on the train comes to him and tells him that it probably wasn't an accident. And it has connections to a deadly gang and revengeance ensues uh the movie will come out on demand on may 21st i didn't even know what this movie was i, I didn't know what the movie was um it, it's, it's a foreign movie because there's subtitles so it seems like he's talking in his native tongue uh mads mickelson um danish right he's danish i think he's danish uh but um this one looks pretty good man this this movie looks good it looks like he it looks like there's some comedy in there as well i know the subtitles will probably you know get people you know probably deter some people but this looks really cool uh, especially from a project that you know no one really knew anything about so or at least i didn't know anything about it so i'm really looking for it and you just have Matt mickelson as a soldier he's got a, like a big he's got like a big beard and uh, i'm all for it man i i love Matt mickelson i will watch him in anything literally anything um so yeah i'm i'm, I'm game for this so uh, there you go. Those were your quick trailer thoughts, because we have some other big trailers that came out this week. One of those trailers is the sequel to The Hitman's Bodyguard, titled The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Uh, they released their first trailer, which brings back Ryan Reynolds as Michael Bryce, a renowned, or renowned, apparently I can't speak now, renowned bodyguard who is taking a sabbatical from his job. When he gets roped in by Selma Hayek's character, Sonia, the wife of Samuel Jackson's character, Darius Kincaid, from the first movie, um, to help her rescue him as he's been kidnapped by a mob boss played by Antonio Banderas. The sequel is directed by the first movie's director, Patrick Hughes, and co-stars Frank Grillo, who is not anywhere in the trailer, uh, Richard E. Grant, who was... In the first movie, uh, he had a very small role he, as one of the people that Michael Bryce saves. Uh, and Morgan Freeman, apparently, is in the movie. But uh, again, he's not in the trailer either. The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard will open on June 16th. I'm 
enjoy the first movie for what it was. So uh, it was just Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson trading quips to one another. Uh, so I'm all for that. And um, it, it allowed Samuel L. Jackson just to say, you know, his favorite catchphrase uh as long as he wanted get out of the fucking like car a three-day adjustment period to figure this out and motherfucker i will bust this. a cap in your ass <laughs> if you don't give up that wheel have you ever said please or please motherfucker why are we always yelling get out of the fucking car. so uh i'm assuming that this will be just like that but i'm looking forward to it yeah no, it, it it looks you know funny it looks action-packed with the first movie so i'm all for it let's move on to the next trailer uh which probably any other week would have been the big trailer of the week I mean, it's still a big trailer of the week, but it would have been this. It would have held the solo title of uh, trailer of the week, and that is Netflix's new movie by Zack Snyder himself, Army of the Dead. The synopsis for the movie reads like followed. Quote, following a zombie outbreak in Las Vegas, a group of mercenaries take the ultimate gamble, venturing into into the quarantine zone to pull off the greatest heist ever attempted. From the looks of the trailer, it looks like Dave Bautista is the leader of the group and recruits everyone. But ultimately, he is the one that is hired by Haruki Sanada's character, a.k.a. Scorpion, in the new Mortal Kombat movie coming out. Um, he's also been in a bunch of other stuff, but I just, you know recency you know did i use that right i don't think i used that right anyway uh the movie co stars a multitude of people but the more familiar names include amir hardwick who looked like he worked out really hard for this movie because he's shirtless for like half of the trailer that he's in uh ella pernell theo rossi who i don't remember seeing in the trailer i think he's in there somewhere i just I maybe i just didn't see him uh garrett hunt uh dylan hunt who looks like he works for sonata's character and becomes part of the becomes part of the group and tig nataro who is a last minute addition because uh, she is replacing um, Chris D'Elia's character, who, of course, uh, was booted off the movie after allegations against him came out. Uh, and her and Zack Snyder worked a lot of stuff out to film, you know, because obviously the movie, was, the movie was already done. And he was still editing the movie. And, you know, the, he bought her in or, you know, they did some weird stuff, you know, because uh, of COVID, obviously, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so they did some weird stuff like, um, you know, filming her in her backyard or like sending her stuff. And she, you know, filmed everything that she could and, and sent it to him. And it looks like it looks seamlessly. She's in the trailer. She has a couple shots in the trailer and it looks, you know, it doesn't look out of, you know, out of proportion or out of, out of anything. So um, I was looking forward to this because I am a big fan of Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead um i really liked his dawn of the dead remake i think it's probably one of the better remakes out there it's also one of the better horror movie remakes out there and one of the better remakes of uh george A. romero's work uh, so uh i was looking forward to this and i remember the first teaser that came out what was it earlier this year and it just wasn't that great i mean it, it got the job done and i was like oh hey this movie's coming out but it didn't be it wasn't like a, oh hey this movie like it wasn't like this trailer this trailer's great um this is really this is actually a really good trailer it looks like something may have happened with dave patisse's character it looks like he probably actually he actually knows a lot of the people that he's recruiting um because at one point he tells one you know one of the ladies like you know it's finally do, it's finally time to do something for us so i think that's that's kind of cool so probably some redemption art going on there but the zombie action in this thing looks very impressive because the zombie the main thing here is that the zombies look like they can actually think um, you know, we, you know, we, we, I think we all joke around with our friends or with our family. It's like the day that zombies learn how to do, you know, parkour or learn how to do martial arts, we're all screwed because, you know, they're, you know, because they'll catch it, they'll catch us all. Um, and that's what it looks like. It, that's what it looks like here. It looks like zombies are doing parkour and it looks like zombies are, there's at one point in that there's that one shot of the trailer where it looks like Batista's like trying to like stab a zombie and he's moving away. Like it's an actual fight scene. So uh, that's very, very frightening and very scary and already makes this movie something different. And I think that's what we all want, especially with something like this. Uh, and you know, um, the, the, the thing that worries me of course is Zack Snyder, you know, um, say what you want about him. And I know there's a lot of loyal people out there. And I mentioned it when I talked about my Snyder cut, when I mentioned, yeah, when I was talking about the Snyder cut, everyone, like all these Zack Snyder fanboys just suddenly started coming out of the blue. Uh, but 
I don't remember a lot of people loving Zack Snyder's work beforehand, but um, I love his early work. I, I, don't, I like 300. I like Dawn of the Dead. There was another movie I liked of his that I can't remember for the life of me what it is now. Uh, Man of Steel. That was the other one. I don't know why I forgot Man of Steel. I, I honestly don't remember. I don't know why I forgot Man of Steel. Anyway, um, but I like, I like that stuff. I like his early work. So I think him going back to, you know, the thing that kind of made him a household name at least, you know, with film nerds, um, you know, the internet nerds like me who go on websites and, you know, do podcasts and stuff, uh, know Zack Snyder because of Dawn of the Dead first. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. I would say the thing that made him a household name was maybe 300, maybe more likely Man of Steel. We can make the argument there, but, um, I like this. I like this. I like this really cool. It looks like there's like a leader of the zombie pack too. It looks like she's like a wife or something. I, this movie looks great. And then of course there's the, the zombie tiger at the end of the, uh, uh, at the end of it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I am looking forward to Army of the Dead. Army of the Dead will stream on Netflix on May 21st. And you can definitely you can definitely put it in your books that we, be we will be talking about Army of the Dead. All right, let's move on to the next trailer, the final trailer of the week, which is F9. I don't know why I made such a dramatic pause. Uh, so uh, the ninth installment of the Fast and the Furious franchise released a brand new trailer this week. And it showed off quite a bit, like quite a bit. Uh, the movie, of course, brings back the gang, the family, if you will, and brings, uh, of course, puts them up against uh, Dom's never before seen or heard of brother or talked about brother, Jacob. Jacob with a K, J A K O B, uh, played by John C. <laughs> And the cast, of course, will bring back some uh, some people that have sat out recently from the franchise. From Tokyo Drift, we have Lucas Black and Bow Wow, along with uh, Jason Tobin. He was one of the friends of, of their characters from Tokyo Drift. Charlize Theron will return as Cypher, as will um, Helen Mirren as Madeline Shaw. Jordana Brewster is coming back as Mia. And, of course, the big one, the one that everyone's talking about, the one that everyone's like, how the hell is he alive? Uh, Sung Kang will come back as Han. Somehow... <laughs> it looks like he's back with the group and they're like oh yeah you're back yeah totally you, you totally didn't die in the third movie um yeah huh uh other cast members other new cast members include uh finn cole from i know him from peaky blinders i also know him from gangs of london he will uh, be appearing in the movie along with michael rooker in some unknown roles uh plus justin lynn who directed the franchise since tokyo drift to fast and the furious 6 will come back to direct this and he also is going to come back to direct fast and the furious 10 or uh, whatever they end up calling that so yeah the franchise has clearly gone for the over-the-top action set pieces which honestly i'm all here for okay look even tyrese's roman brings it up in the trailer they've raced against a tank and a submarine a plane and they dragged a safe across Rio for crying out loud. And now they're doing magnets. <laughs> Y'all ever thought about the wild missions we've been on? We've taken out planes, trains, tanks. I'm not going to even think about the submarine. <laughs> and now we got cars flying in the air. They're doing magnets. What's And it looks like, even though it started off as a joke, and we all knew that at some point it was going to happen, it looks like they might be going to space. <laughs> this franchise was about street racing. If you remember, it could go all the way back. To early 2000s. This movie was about street racing. And it was a subtle knockoff of Point Break. That originally was not going to have Vin Diesel as Dominic Toretto. Because originally they wanted Timothy Oliphant. Now look, I love Timothy Oliphant. I'm a huge fan of Tim and the Elephant. I love Justified. Um, I just started watching Deadwood and he's very good on that. Uh, I know I'm late to the train on Deadwood. Apologies for that. But um, imagine... Timothy Oliphant saying, I live my life a quarter mile at a time. Not Dominic Tourette, not uh, Vin Diesel. No, Timothy Oliphant, who had just done, I think, Gone in 60 Seconds, or I think he skipped on Fast and the Furious and then did Gone in... I don't know, whichever, whichever one of the two. But the mere fact that this franchise will hit 10 movies, 11 if you count Hobbs and Shaw, is mind-blowing. And I, for one, will be sitting in the theater and probably a rented out one with my family because, you know, COVID... We'll be enjoying, and as much as I try not to swear on the podcast anymore, even though, you know, it's my podcast, I can do what I want, I'm going to swear right now. So if you have any young people around you, you might want to cover their sec their ears for a few seconds. I'm going, I'm going to be enjoying the fuck out of this movie, because this movie looks batshit insane, okay? They have magnets. <laughs> There's a one point where Jacob is ziplining through a building, and Dominic Terrell just comes out of nowhere and just spears him into a building. Like, come on. The other trailer had cars, had Dominic Toretto, like, 
perfectly lining up his car to like i don't know some sort of anchor or a wire or something and then it's spinning him around like it was a yo-yo look this like i mentioned this franchise is not for everybody this franchise is is all about over-the-top action and if you're not down with that that's fine let us enjoy the pure cinematic (laughs) masterpiece that is the fast and the furious franchise um and yes i obviously cannot see that with a straight face uh but let us enjoy it just let us enjoy it it's dumb popcorn fun action. You can have your Transformers. Let us have Fast and the Furious. Are they good movies? They used to be. <laughs> well, uh, uh, they were okay movies. They were still dumb fun action. They were still dumb fun popcorn movies back in the day. But just let us enjoy it. Who's it hurting? Come on. F9 opens on June 25th. Uh, I, for one, will be watching this movie. And yes, we will be talking about F9 on the podcast. Anyone wants to join me, you're more than welcome open invitation all right those are your trailers for the week uh all the trailer links will be uh, will be down below in the description slash show notes area so you guys can go check those out let us move on to the quick, quick fire movie news items of the week uh, before i get to the quick fire movie news i actually have on my list i do want to mention one thing uh and that is the closing of arc light cinemas um obviously it, it, when the news was announced earlier this week you know there's been a lot of directors and people within the industry talking about you know if you follow any of them you probably saw it on your timeline uh, on twitter or instagram or stuff like that everyone talking about you know how sad they are about the arc light closing down and for me who lives in the chicagoland area and has uh, the closest arc light that's around me is about like 30 35 minutes away driving uh, on the expressway <laughs> I don't have, you know, it's it's hard for, you know, anyone, you know, outside of L.A. to have any kind of, you know, experience or story with the Arclight Cinemas. But I know if you live in the L.A. area that this is a huge deal um, because the Arclight Cinemas is just one of those, you know, cornerstones in, in, in anything, really. Um, you know, there's the Arclight Cinemas was like where a lot of studios would screen their movies for people. Uh, it would be, they would do their word, their premieres there for a lot of people as well. Uh, they would have a lot of Q&As with directors and the stars, and they had some really great programming. I know my first experience going to an Arclight Cinema Theater was uh, on a trip that I took to L.A. with my brother, uh, one of the first years that, we, that we've done it, and my first experience there was watching Macbeth, the the one with Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard and I just remember like going in there and they had like a display case with like I forgot what movie it was but they had a display case with like you know stuff for a certain movie and every year we go to LA we would go to the Arclight Cinema there because it was it it just kind of became a tradition of ours to go uh to go there and uh every every year we did of course there was you know new props and and clothes it was usually like clothing from the actors that they wore on set that they would just display there uh every now and then they would have something else uh and we would go to the arc light and we, w- we would watch a movie and you know here in the chicagoland area uh we would go and we would watch you know some movies here i remember we watched the, the first time i watched force awakens was at the arc light cinemas here in chicago because well i mean that was the only place we could get tickets but it was also really cool to watch it there because it was like an experience. It was like, I, 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 if it sounds really cheesy, but it was like, it was like watching it in LA because it was, it was an arc light and it really sucks uh, that it's gone because obviously that has a major history and, and, and stuff like that. And with arc light closing down, there's also the Cynodome closing down. I saw, I've seen one movie in the Cynodome because every time we go to LA, we usually watch it in the actual theater. We never really watched anything in the Cynodome just because it didn't li- line up time wise. But the last time we were in LA, of course, it was a couple of years ago because we didn't go this year, last year because of the pandemic. We probably won't go again this year because of the pandemic. I saw my first movie at the Cinedome and it was Jojo Rabbit. And it was so cool to see that. My brother, who lived in LA for a little bit because he went to college out there, uh, he would go to the Cinedome every now and then. He told me about his experience there. And, um, and then just reading all the stories of all these actors and actresses, like, uh, David Ayer and Edgar Wright and Olivia Wilde, who had her premiere at a uh, Booksmart at the Arclight. It's crazy to to see that, and it's and it sucks, and and it's 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 again, it's really hard for me to gauge my experience with 
experiences of people from LA because obviously the arc light is more dominant over there than it is over here in Chicago. But it sucks every time a chain like that, especially a chain that really cared about filmmaking, really cared about the movies they did. Because one of the crazy things about arc light was that, you know, you walk into Let's say an AMC, because obviously AMC is one of the biggest theater chains out there. You walk into an AMC, most of the time you're walking in and they're playing like ads and stuff and like commercials. And a lot of times you're seeing it on repeat, depending on how early you get there. Not Arclight. Arclight, they, you would go in, you would sit down, you would uh, look at this kind of like photo screen. It wouldn't play anything, so it would be completely dark. Well, it wouldn't be dark, but it would be completely silent. And you're just, you know, hearing people's conversations, you're hearing your own. And it would start, and the trailers would automatically start. There was no ads it was, or anything. They'd have someone come in, and they would do their spiel. And yeah, it was really cool. So that sucks that the arc light's closing. And because I, I loved that theater going out to LA and that being one of the traditions that I, my brother and I would have. Um, but I just wanted to mention it because, again, it sucks. Anytime, you know, something closes like that, especially theaters, because obviously, you know, that's where we go watch our movies. It, it's it's going to be hard, and it's going to suck. And... I just, especially from last week, having the conversation about how movie theaters are dying and, you know, me being headstrong about like, no, they're not. This is different because obviously, you know, they were impacted by, by COVID and stuff. So, all right. I just wanted to, me- I just wanted to quickly mention that before I got into anything because, um, I really like the arc light and it's a shame that it's closing down and it's never going to open again. Uh, I know people are trying to save it. Uh, I don't know if it will work. I hope it works. Hopefully it works. Hopefully someone comes in and, and buys it at least the Cynodome, you know, because that's, that's pretty cool. So. All right, uh, let's move on to the no easy transition from that. Let's just talk about the quick fire movie news items. Uh, Shazam! Fury of the Gods has added Lucy Liu to the cast, and according to reports, she would be playing one of the villains in the movie. The sister to Helen Mirren's character, Hespera, Liu will play Callisto. Both characters are from Greek mythology, the daughters of Atlas. Uh, and although they don't, they don't have a DC counterpart, it will be interesting to see how they're used. Uh, the A in Shazam, because the Shazam, Shazam does stand for a lot of Greek gods. Uh, the A in Shazam stands for Atlas, which gives him the stamina of Atlas. So maybe they're going back for their father's powers or something like that. Or trying to see maybe if Billy Batson is really worthy of what's going on. Uh, Shazam Fury of the Gods will open on June 2nd, 2023. Uh, production is apparently gearing up for Aquaman 2. And casting tidbits are starting to come out because this week... Uh, you're on Greyjoy from Game of Thrones himself. Pilo, I always mispronounce the last name. I never know how to say his last name. Asbeek, I think that's how you probably say his last name. He is in talks to join the sequel. James Wan is uh, coming back to direct the movie with David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick writing the movie. He wrote the first movie. Uh, he also wrote a bunch of episodes of The Walking Dead, which I didn't know about. He also wrote Orphan, Graph of the Titans, uh, The Conjuring 2, and The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, which is the third movie that's coming out soon. Uh, he is coming back to write the script for the movie. No plot details or who Asbeek will play, uh, but the sequel does have a release date of December 16th, 2022. So I guess it makes sense that they're actually going to start production. So yeah, I take back my what? Even though I already knew that because I wrote the outline. Just trying to make content, guys. Uh, Hugh Jackman and Laura Dern have joined the film The Sun, which is being directed by Florin Zeller, who directed the Oscar-nominated film The Father. And no, it is not a sequel, unless it, it is a surprising sequel to a movie that I have not watched yet, unfortunately. The movie is based off Zeller's play of the same name, and is about Nicholas, who is going through a difficult period after his parents' divorce. Maybe Jackman and Laura, uh, Laura Dern are playing uh, the parents. They don't really say who they're playing in the movie, but uh, maybe that's who they are. Uh, Zeller is reteaming with Christopher Hampton, who co-wrote The Father, which is, uh, the script anyway, is nominated for an Oscar. And yes, The Father is based on a play that Zeller also did. So, there you go. I uh, just wanted to mention that because it's Oscar season and we're going to be, you know, talking about the Oscars soon. Uh, speaking of Oscars, Carrie Mulligan, who is also nominated for an Oscar, as is her movie uh, Promising Young Woman that she appears in, is joining Adam Sandler's newest next Netflix movie, Spaceman, which will be a drama, not a comedy. I know you heard Adam Sandler and Netflix and you automatically think comedy, so did I. But no, it is a drama. The movie is based off a novel by Jaroslav Kalfar. I think that's how you pronounce that name. I apologize to uh, Mr. Kalfar. And follows an astronaut played by Sandler, who is sent to the edge of the galaxy to find mystifying ancient dust. As a scientist... Or as the astronaut should say, apologies. As the astronaut finds his earthly life falling apart, he turns to the only voice who can help him try to put it back together, which 
also happens to be a mysterious creature from the beginning of time lurking in the shadows of the ship. And no, Mulligan will not be playing that creature or be voicing that creature. Mulligan will be playing Sandler's wife in the movie. Directing-wise, Johan Renkik, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, you know, you guys know him bad with last names. Um, he directed uh, episodes of Chernobyl, the hit TV series. Uh, he will direct a movie, although no word yet on when the movie will go into production. But there you go. Uh, Remy, moving on. Uh, Remy Youssef is in negotiations to join Yorgos Lathamos' newest film, Poor Things, which already has Emma Stone set to star, and William Defoe also in talks to join. Uh, Yorgos Lathamos, by the way, the director of The Lobster and The Favorite, which, of course, Emma Stone starred in The Favorite. The movie is a Victorian tale of love, discovery, and scientific daring, as tells as it tells the incredible story of Belle Baxter, a young woman brought back to life by an eccentric but brilliant scientist. Yusuf's role is under wraps at the moment, but he did also just win a Golden Globe, I almost said Oscar, a Golden Globe for his work on the TV series Remy, which he stars and, co and writes and produces and creates. Moving on. Uh, Joel Cornish, the director of Attack the Block and The Kid Who Would Be King, has signed on to direct and write a feature adaptation of Mark Miller's space hero comic Starlight. The comic was published back in 2014 by Image Comics and is described as both... Flash Gordon meets The Dark Knight Returns, and Buzz Lightyear meets Unforgiven. The story follows a space hero named Duke McQueen, who saved the universe 35 years ago, but when he comes back to Earth, no one believes him and his, and his fantastic stories. Now an aging family man, he finds himself called back to the skies for one last adventure when he meets his old rocket ship, or when his old rocket ship shows up. Sorry. Worded that weird on my outline. Apologize. The movie has been in the works since 2014 because Gary Whitta, who was one of the writers on Rogue One, a Star Wars story, was hired to write the script. But it looks like Cornish will be uh, reportedly starting from scratch. So, there you go. Uh, moving on, STX Films has gotten the rights to the sci-fi fantasy adventure Universe's Most Wanted, which will star Army of the Dead lead. Dave Batista. The movie will be directed by Brad Payton, who directed Rampage and San Andreas, with a script written or being written by F. Scott Frazier, who wrote the script for Triple X, the, the Return of Xander Cage. The movie will start production in late July and centers on a small town that gets a big surprise when a spaceship carrying the universe's most wanted and dangerous criminals crash lands in their backyard. Soon the sheriff and his son become heroes when they find themselves helping an intergalactic peacekeeper, played by Dave Bautista, to keep the ragtag group of alien prisoners from escaping and taking over the world. That seems pretty cool. Uh, moving on, Paul Greengrass, the director of The Bourne Supremacy and The Bourne Ultimatum, along with Captain Phillips, and recently, or not recently, well, I mean, it came out earlier this year, uh, News of the World, has signed on to direct Universal's political thriller Night of Camp David, which is an adaptation of the 1965 book by Fletcher Nebel. The script, I think that's how I pronounced the last name, uh, the script will be written by Jed Mercurio, who created and wrote the British uh, series The Bodyguard, which starred Richard Madden, a.k.a. Rob Stark from Game of Thrones. The Bodyguard, by the way, very good. If you have not watched that, highly recommend that. I know it's not a movie, but I, I, I do watch TV, guys. Uh, the book follows Iowa Senator Jim Mac, uh, McVeigh, who is summoned to Camp David by President Mark Hollaback. McVeigh, is, who is expected to become Hollaback's next VP, becomes concerned because Hollaback shows signs of intense paranoia. He erratically expresses his desire to develop a closer relationship between the U.S. and the Soviet Union and attempts to cut ties with the American allies in Europe. Hollenbeck also believes the American news media are conspiring against him. God, that doesn't sound familiar. Anyway, uh, McAvee is the only person who notices that Hollenbeck's mind is crumbling as the president, as the presidential advisors pol and politicians he attempts to warn only ignore him. The sole person in possession of evidence of Hollenbeck's mental decline is his mistress, Rita. All of that sounds vaguely familiar somehow. Uh, I just will mention that the book was republished in 2018 uh, when um, all of that sounded vaguely familiar for some reason. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Moving on. Uh, Neil Neeson's next action movie has rounded out its supporting cast. Uh, the movie is titled Memory, but will be directed, or and will be directed, not but will be directed, and will be directed by Martin Campbell, who directed Goldeneye, The Mask of Zora, which I actually watched earlier this year. Actually, better than I remember. Uh, Casino Royale, uh, unfortunately, Green Lantern, uh, which we won't talk about anymore. And The Foreigner, which was his last movie that he directed with uh, Jackie Chan and Pierce Brosnan. 
The supporting cast is Guy Pierce, Monica Bellucci, and up and up and coming stars uh, Ryan Fearon from the live action Beauty and the Beast movie. He was also in HBO's His Dark Materials. Harold Torres from the TV series Zero Zero Zero, which is uh, getting a lot of acclaim recently, and Taj Atwell from the TV series Truth Seekers and Line of Duty, both of which you can watch on. Uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, N- Nielsen <laughs> will play Alex Lewis, an expert assassin with a, quote, reputation of discreet precision. It looks like he has a particular set of skills, if you ask me. But Alex refuses to complete a job for a dangerous criminal organization. He becomes a target and must go on the hunt for those who want him dead. Veteran FBI agents Vincent Sarah, played by Guy Pierce, Linda Armistad, played by Atwell, and Mexican intelligence liaison hugo marquez played by torres are bought in to investigate the trial the tr- trial the trail of bodies leading them to closer to alex but also drawing the ire of the local tech mognal mognal wow mogul i totally butchered that uh devana sealman played by monica bellucci with the crime syndicate and the fbi hot in hot pursuit alex has the skills to stay ahead except for one thing He is struggling with severe memory loss affecting his every move. As details blur and enemies come closer, Alex must question his every action and who he can ultimately trust. The movie was actually based off a book titled Die Zack Alzheimer, if you want to go try to find that. Uh, It was also a Belgium film called The Memory of a Killer. So they already adapted this. So it's kind of a remake, at least a reimagining. Apparently the movie is currently in production in Bulgaria, so there is that to look forward to. Once, uh, once that comes out. And the final quick fire movie news item of the week is the Netflix vampire thriller Day Shift has added more to its cast. The movie will see Jamie Foxx play a hardworking blue collar dad who just wants to provide a good life for his quick witted daughter. But his mundane San Fernando Valley pool cleaning job is a front for his real source of income hunting and killing vampires as part of an international union of vampire killers or hunters, I should say. I guess Keller's too. Uh, the movie uh, rounded out its supporting cast this week with Snoop Dogg. Yes, that's Snoop Dogg and martial arts and martial artist and actor Scott Adkins, who really is the reason why I'm excited for this movie even more. Uh, other one, by the way, Scott Adkins from like the Undisputed movies. Uh, he was also in the movie called Triple Threat, which I think a lot of these are on Netflix. He has a lot of movies on Netflix. If you want to go check them out? Uh, he was also the bad guy in the last It Man movie. If you want to. You know, need to face the name in if you watch those movies. Uh, other well-known co-stars include Megan Good and Dave Franco. Yes, that Dave Franco. Another thing I'm interested in is the director. The movie will be directed by J.J. Perry, who was a stunt coordinator and second unit director on some pretty big films like uh, Mortal Kombat, the first one, uh, Blade, Constantine, uh, Serenity, which now has a bad taste in our, all of our mouths, I'm sure, uh, The Fate of the Furious and the upcoming F9. Uh, the John Wick franchise, and the, also the other upcoming movie, Without Remorse, with Michael B. Jordan. Um, interesting antidote with J.J. Perry. I actually met him years ago. Um, actually, it's actually it was probably right around this time, to be honest. Um, I think uh, wasn't around this time. It might have been around this time. Uh, I think so because I think I saw something on my Facebook memories. I met J.J. Perry at a film festival, and he was a very nice man. Very very nice man. Very cool. Uh, obviously, loves what he does. Um, He's still doing it, obviously. But the thing that I love about J.J. Perry is that he used me as a pretend punching bag because he was working on, I think he was working or wanted to work on Warrior. I think he, has, I think he also did stuff for for Warrior as well um, because he, he was or he was working on something um, in, re, in regards to like mix, like MMA or, or boxing um, because he, he was talking to me, my brother, and I think one of the programmers there. And he saw me and he's like can you just stand right here real quick so he like sets me up and he starts using me as a pretend punching bag and i knew i just knew he was not gonna punch me because that's you know that would have been really messed up and i don't think he would have done that but he used me as a pretend punching bag to show how he wanted to do stuff and how he wanted to like lay the groundwork for a scene and how he wanted to set it up and that honestly that was one of the best moments of my life because (laughs) i just thought it was really cool um and I, 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 at that point, I had already been a huge fan of his already. So, and I'm still a huge fan of his. So, him making his directorial debut here is, um, or I don't know if it's his directorial debut, but he is directing the movie. Um, it's really cool. Uh, so, I'm a huge fan of JJ Perry, and uh, I will always remember that story because uh, I feared for my life, but also, no, I didn't need to fear for my life because even if, I think if you threw the punch, I don't think you would have thrown that hard because. <laughs> Not that, I'm, not that I'm calling him, you know, like 
weak or anything, but I just think that he knew that, you know, it wasn't a real fight scene, so he wasn't going to throw a punch. Um, I, I always find that antidote very funny because anytime I see his name pop up on a, on a credits, on a credit screen, because it's like, oh, it's JJ Perry. Cool. He used me as a punching bag once. I thought that was really cool. All right. Uh, so that's your quick fire movie news items of the week. Uh, I'm going to stop, uh, stop embarrassing myself and let's move on to the big movie news items of the week. All right. So the first big movie news item of the week we're going to talk about is, a weird one. Kevin Smith is auctioning off his latest film, the horror anthology Kilroy Was Here, as a non fungible token, or as the kids are calling it these days online, an NFT. And if you're wondering what the hell an NFT is, let's hope this movie news item will give you a little bit more info on that, because I heard about NFTs and I know what they were either. The owner of the NFT will, quote, secure the rights to exhibit, distribute, and stream the work, making it a means for whoever owns the movie to earn money outside the blockchain, end quote. Smith did comment on this, saying, quote, as an indie artist, I'm always looking for a new platform through which to tell a story, and crypto has the potential to prove that, while also intersecting with almost 25 years of experience selling real-world collectibles online at the brick-and-motor Jalen Silent Bob's Secret Stash. Back in 1994, we took clerks up to Sundance and sold it. Selling Kilroy as an NFT feels very similar. Whoever buys it could choose to monetize it traditionally or simply own the film that nobody ever sees but them. We're not trying to raise financing by selling NFTs for a Kilroy movie. The completed Kilroy movie is the NFT, and if it works, we suddenly have a new stage on which I and other better artists other than me can tell our stories telling taking a little jab at himself i like that uh so this is interesting right uh so like smith said there and the way that it works is that whoever ends up buying the nft of kill warrior was here which will also be the first movie if it does sell as an nft to ever be sold as an nft would have the sole rights to the movie and this person could choose to never let this movie see the light of day or they can choose to work out with movie theaters and be like, hey, here's the movie. You can show it, but I get a cut of the money, I suppose. I, I'm assuming that's how it works. I don't know. Uh, Smith also op- op- uh, opened up a crypto shop that includes things from uh, his movies, his other movies that he has up there as well. Um, that was the other thing, big thing. But this is that this obviously the, the fact that Kilroy was here is being sold as, as an NFT is, is rather interesting, I guess. If you want to look up more about NFTs. You're more than welcome to because I've tried to and it seems like he pretty much, you know, it seems like, you know, you, you own whatever that piece is. You own that for what it is and you can do whatever you want with that. I know like a I think it was like a tennis player who was selling off like a piece of her like arm as an NS, as an NFT as well. I, I think that's what it, I think that's when I, I think that's honestly when I first heard about NFTs, to be honest. It's just really weird. Whatever. It, it's it. It's just it, it, it's just the idea of him selling off his movie as an NFC is just, it's, it's crazy. All right, whatever. Let's, let's just move on. Let's just move on. The reboot of the 1984 low-budget cult classic trauma film, The Toxic Avenger, is back in the news as it has added Jacob Tremblay. The young actor now joins Peter Dinklage, who was attached to the movie when it was first announced. Tremblay, by the way, from movies like The Room, uh, Wonder, uh, Good Boys. He was he also had that small role in uh, that small but memorable role in Doctor Sleep as a uh, baseball boy. Uh, I know I'll let you I'll let you guys recover because that, that was that scene was horrifying. Uh, the reboot will follow quote a mild mannered janitor at a health club who was pushed out of a second story window by bullies into a vat of toxic of toxic waste. The chemicals cause him to transform into a hideously deformed immune gifted with superhuman size and strength. He must go from shunned outcast to underdog hero as he races to save his son, his friends, and his community from the forces of corruption and greed. Which is pretty similar to what the original movie was. Uh, the original producers, Lloyd Kaufman and Michael Herz, will return to produce the movie with Macon Blair directing and writing the reboot. Blair actually made his directorial debut with the 2017 Netflix film uh the comedy uh i don't feel at home in this world anymore i have not seen it uh i can't remember what the buzz about the movie was i forgot to look that up apologies the original was pretty successful uh being the toxic avenger uh as it got four sequels an animated tv spinoff for kids called toxic crusaders a musical and it even got a marvel comic book series so there is a brand for the Toxic Avenger. Uh, no word yet on who Dremblay will play. He's playing one of the bullies, or maybe he's playing the son. Who knows? But he's involved, 
and he's joining Peter Dinklage, who I'm assuming is going to play the Toxic Avenger or and something along those lines. So uh, again, I think I mentioned this when we first talked about it. I and I, I have still not gone back and and rewatched the Toxic Avenger. I do remember watching it. Can't remember if I liked it or not. I honestly can't remember, so I had to go back and watch it. When I do, I will let you know. Moving on, Mark Camel will co-star with comedian Brett Krishner in a movie adaptation of The Machine, a viral comedy bit supposedly inspired by Krishner's actual life. The movie is said to be a genre-bending mix of comedy and buddy action. The stand-up comedy sketch Krishner talks about his experience in college learning Russian, but no intention of actually learning the language. And Krishner actually did a semester of college in Russia, just to get an easy minor, but ended up joining the Russian mob by accident, apparently, and coining the nickname The Machine. Uh, the movie, however, will follow the story, making the comedian deal with the Russian mob 20 years later after his drunken ventures. The mobsters that he wronged in the past are coming back for revenge. Who Hamill will play is unknown at the moment, but Peter Antonisio, I think that's how you, Antonisio, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, he directed uh, Keanu, he's also done a bunch of... Uh, episodes of Keenan and Peele will be directing the movie, although no production date is set just yet. I remember the first time I heard about the story, because Christian talks about it a lot. <laughs> I remember watching it uh, out of the blue, and it's kind of funny. Uh, when you think about it, it's kind of just one of those like drunken situations. You don't really know what's going on. You're in a foreign country. You're just getting drunk with a bunch of people, and then all of a sudden, you join the mob, apparently. So that's what it is. Uh, so if you never watched it, or if you never heard about it, or you want more details about it, kind of maybe how the movie will go, I will link the sketch down below so you guys can go watch it. It's kind of funny when you think about it, but yeah. And by the way, Krishna does a lot of his uh, routines shirtless. So if you're wondering why there's a shirtless man on your screen, it's because of that. Uh, moving on. <laughs> Lots of moving on from things that we want I'm comfortable about on this podcast this week. Jordan Vonk Roberts, the director of Kong Skull Island, is set to direct the live action adaptation of Gundam from the script by Brian K. Vaughn, who was the man behind uh, great comics like Saga and Why the Last Man. And, oh yeah, Why the Last Man. And the movie will be made for Netflix. The anime, uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, by the way, is when I when I refer to Gundam, I'm referring to Mobile Suit Gundam. Uh, for it was first introduced in 1979, where it has human pilots manning mobile mech suits to defend the universe. The franchise has gone through uh, numerous series, anime series, obviously, and video games, and uh, much, much more. Uh, it's unclear right now at least at the moment what they're going to be pulling from because there's a lot of stuff they can pull from uh, to say the least but Vought Rognertz um he's a fan he is a fan of a lot of anime stuff uh a well-known fan a self-professed fan he was also connected to direct a Metal Gear Solid movie with Oscar Isaacs as a star but I think that might take a bit of a back burner right now because obviously um Vogue roberts is working on this and isaac is uh, doing marvel's moon knight at the moment or at least he's you know they're in pre-production for that so i'm excited for this i think this is pretty cool uh i think uh a gundam movie is pretty cool the fact that it's going straight to netflix is interesting um but I, that's not the deter it uh, i just think it's it's pretty cool that they want to do that if you've never seen any mobile suit gundam stuff i highly recommend you watch it because it's actually pretty good watch it from the beginning because as you know the series go on it kind of gets <laughs> a little bit more complicated but especially if you don't watch anime but uh it's pretty cool it's pretty good uh especially coming from a guy who doesn't watch a lot of anime if i'm saying it's a good anime then i mean that my opinion doesn't really matter but if you ask anyone who watches a lot of a lot of anime gundam is probably going to be on their list at some point <laughs> Moving on. Let's just move on. Mike Flanagan, the director behind films like Oculus, Hush, Dr. Sleep, Gerald's Game, and the two seasons of Haunting Of on Netflix, uh, has found his next film, which is an adaptation of Christopher Pike's sci-fi novel, The Season of Passage. Flanagan will co-write the script with his brother, James Flanagan, which has a synopsis that reads like this, quote, Dr. Lauren Wagner was a celebrity. She was involved with the most exciting adventure mankind has ever undertaken, a manned, expedi manned expedition to Mars. The whole world admired and respected her, but Lauren knew fear. Inside, voices entreating her to love them. Outside, the mystery of the missing group that had gone before her, the dead group. But were they simply dead or something else? That is a synopsis. Flanagan just finished his latest project called Midnight Mass for Netflix, which is an original series that they shot in Vancouver uh, quietly under the COVID restrictions. He's also signed on to do another adaptation of Pike's novel, The Midnight Club, which uh, 
who knows when he'll get to do that. But he apparently uh, Flanagan has moved on from Stephen King to Christopher Pike. Uh, and it looks like they're all going to be horror related. And I'm all for it because Mike Flanagan is honestly one of the best horror directors out there right now. Uh, I'm cl- I'm clearly saying that. Um, just flat out. No argument. <laughs> it's, it's Mike Flanagan for me anyway. All right, moving on. Chris McKay, the director of the Lego Batman movie, is in negotiations to direct and produce Universal Pictures' Renfield, a monster movie centered on Dracula's henchmen and based on an original story outlined from Robert Kirkman. Yes, that Robert Kirkman, the man behind The Walking Dead. In the novel, R.M. Renfield was an inmate at the Lunatic Asylum who was thought to be suffering from delusions but actually was a servant of Dracula. Plot details on the movie are under wraps, but it is believed that it will take place in the present day and it is not a period piece, which will be interesting considering obviously that Dracula was a period piece, so we'll have to see how they do that. Uh, This isn't the first time the movie was uh, being circled by Universal. Dexter Fletcher was going to direct the movie at one point, but left to do Paramount's reboot of The Saint. Dexter Fletcher, by the way, the director of... Eddie the Eagle, uh, Rocket Man. I don't know why I blinked on Rocket Man. Rocket Man. Uh, he also did some uh, director work on. I believe he did some director work on uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. I think he was a the director they bought in after Brian Singer had to to leave. But uh, yeah, uh, reportedly Universal met with a number of directors, but 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 it was McKay's pitch that won him the job. McKay has the Tomorrow Award, which is set out to come out in July on Prime Video. He's also connected to a Nightwing movie. Uh, which has been in the works for a few years now. So, wouldn't count on that happening anytime soon, it looks like. Uh, Renfield now joins Universal's other monster movies that are in either being done directly by them or being done with Blumhouse. Uh, the Wolfman, which is being directed by the Invisible Man director, Leigh Whannell, and will star Ryan Gosling. You have a Van Helsing movie being produced by James Wan. Two different Dracula movies, one being directed by Chloe Zhao, who uh, directed No Man Land, which I finally watched, thoroughly enjoyed, uh, and one being done by Blumhouse with Karen Kusama, the director of Jennifer's Body and The Invitation, who is writing and directing and, co-ri- uh, directing and co-writing that. Universal, back on the monster trade. No, not not uh, interconnected, not a universe, because they tried that and remarkably failed. Fell on their face. Blew it up. I already swore on this podcast, so they fucked it up. Basically, they, that's, that's what they did. They fucked it up. All right, moving on uh, to the final movie news item of the week, at least at the time of this recording. So if anything drops, obviously I'll drop it after this movie news item. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen has joined the cast of Indiana Jones 5. This, of course, after last week when it was announced that Phoebe Waller-Bridge from Fleabag, the TV series Fleabag, uh, has joined. Like Waller-Bridge's character, Milkison's character is under wraps at the moment, but they will join Harrison Ford reprising, of course, the iconic character of Indiana Jones. James Mangold will be taking over directing duties from Steven Spielberg, who will remain on the project as producer, alongside franchise producers Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall. James Mangold, by the way, director of The Wolverine and Lo- Logan and Ford vs. Ferrari and uh, a bunch of other movies as well. Those are the most recent movies that he's done. Uh, John Williams will also return to do the score for the movie with production expected to begin this summer uh, for a July 29th, 2022 release. Milkinson is becoming quite a busy man. Like we mentioned, he has uh, that movie coming out that we talked about earlier on the podcast, the, the trailer for that. I already forgot the name of it for some reason. Why is that? Writers of Justice. Writers of, Just- Writers of Justice. Uh, he has that. Uh, he's also signed on to another franchise in Fantastic Beasts, where he will re- be replacing Johnny Depp's character. Uh, and he also is in the Oscar-nominated film Another Round. So he's not nominated, but the movie is nominated, so he may probably be making the rounds a little bit on that um maybe who knows but uh this is pretty cool bad guy what do you think yeah he's playing the bad guy because i mean you know you know he tends to play the bad guy sometimes i'm just saying he tends to play he's either playing a bad guy or he's playing a shady guy or he's playing a guy that maybe turns on indy at some point maybe he's not a complete bad guy but he turns on him at some point someone shady who knows but he's joining the movie so (laughs) there you go so yeah we're probably gonna be hearing a lot about indiana jones obviously with production starting soon and now we have these cast members coming out i'm assuming that i feel like every week or at least every other week we're going to be getting some sort of casting update, which I'm okay with. It's fine, especially if it's big names like Mads Mikkelsen and, and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. So I'm I'm okay with that. I really am. All right, everybody. That's it. Yes, that is it. That is all the movie news items I have for you guys, at least at the time of this recording. If anything drops, I'll put it right here. 
Otherwise, thank you very much for listening to the podcast, wherever you're maybe listening to this, whether you're listening to this on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, on Spotify, um, wherever you may be listening to this, please make sure to follow, like, subscribe, whatever feature it is to make sure uh, that makes sure that you get the podcast whenever it comes out every, which is pretty much every week. Uh, next week on the podcast, we will be doing, of course, uh, our usual movie news items of the week. The week after that, we will be talking about uh, Mortal Kombat because we will be watching that because that comes out next week uh probably won't have a podcast up until monday maybe tuesday um tuesday at the very latest but uh but yeah we'll be doing that so yeah be sure to go check out all the links down below uh we have the trailers down there that all that came out this week uh let me know what your favorite trailer of the week was i put a poll up on the twitter page if you want to go over there and give us a vote from the last time i checked it it looked like army of the dead was winning but it was only winning by one vote so uh I haven't checked it since I was started recording, so you want to go vote over there. Um, yeah, let me know what you thought about the news items this week. Obviously, there was a very big week for movie news items and movie trailer-wise. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast this week. Hopefully, all of you are staying safe and uh, cautious. Obviously, the pandemic's still out there, so keep wearing your mask, keep washing your hands, keep social distancing as much as you can and whenever you can. Uh, and as always, be good people to each other uh because the world needs it man it's it literally feels like every week there's just something new that is just it's it sucks but um yeah uh, just be good people to each other honestly it's not that hard it really really isn't that hard to be good people to one to one another but yeah all right uh that's it to all the movie news items i got for you guys thank you so much for listening to the podcast this week i will see all of you lovely people next week and online throughout the week if you want to talk about any particular movie news item you know where to find me instagram twitter all that is linked down below thank you guys i'll see you guys all next week be good to each other and as always go watch some movies whoop, whoop. yeah give it up movies